grateful for your engagement. A few housekeeping notes. We will keep this discussion as close to an hour as possible. Feel free to utilize the Zoom's Q&A feature to send in questions throughout the discussion and we will dis address as many as possible during the last 20 minutes. This discussion is not for press attribution. And if you haven't done so already, please participate in the poll that you see on your screen. We will share the result at the end of the webinar. A quick note, if you don't know about us, Diligence Vault, we are a two-sided digital diligence platform that facilitates more effective due diligence and information exchange between investor and their asset managers. Like everything else we do, today's webinar is meant to be collaborative between Diligence Vault and the members of our ecosystem and the broader investment community. If you would like to learn more about us, to set up a demo with our team, or to get on the mailing list for our future webinars, email us at ask at diligencevault.com. Now, let me introduce Suzanne Goron from Goldman Sachs, who will be moderating the panel and leading the conversation forward. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's joining today. Thank you for joining us on a very busy day for something a uh, discussion that we think is very topical. I'm Suzanne Gorin. I'm the former head of private equity and venture capital manager selection at Goldman Sachs, where we invested over $2 billion a year in a variety of private markets managers. And my current role is as an advisor to a group called Launch with GS, which is our focus on underrepresented entrepreneurs and managers. So we are also evaluating venture capital and private equity managers through that lens. And now I'll turn it over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Jeff, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure, happy to go first. Thanks very much for that, uh, Suzanne and Guillaume. Um, so Jean-Francois Movis, um, I'm Head of Operational Due Diligence um, at the Pension Protection Fund. Uh, we're a UK public corporation responsible for protecting people in the UK with defined benefit pension um, when their employer becomes insolvent. Uh, we currently manage just over 36 billion sterling in net assets, um, and we have over 275,000 members. Um, so me and my team were responsible for operational due diligence oversight of a portfolio of circa 70 um, investment managers, and that's across all asset classes. Um, in the private market space specifically, we have just over 35 investment managers in private equity, direct real estate, alt credit, timber farming and infrastructure. Uh, I joined the PPF back at the end of 2018, um, where uh, before that I was with the Mercer Sentinel business here in the UK, uh, working as a senior consultant, providing ODD and operational consulting to various institutional clients. Um, I've been working in the investment industry for just going on 19 years now. In so, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks Diligence Vault for organizing this webinar and the opportunity uh, to participate. Uh, my name is uh, Kwai Braumuller. I'm part of the ODD team at City Private Bank based here in London. I previously was the EMEA head of operational risk for uh, Mercer Sentinel, which is a division of Mercer Investments. Prior to Mercer, I worked as a senior consultant for what's now Willis Towers Watson. I started my career uh, in the investment industry uh, many moons ago now, working for a number of uh, large fund administrators based in the Netherlands. I moved to London uh, 13 years ago now uh, to work as the operations manager for a fund of hedge funds. And after that, I switched uh, my focus uh, to uh, entirely um, be exclusively executing operational due diligence reviews. Um, at City Investment Management, uh, we manage an alternatives platform of over 100 investment managers, um, including hedge funds, private equity, and real estate. And we have a global ODD team split between London and the US, including New York, uh, Denver, and San Francisco. Great, thank you both for your introductions. So let's jump right in. I think um, we have more than enough to talk about in this hour based on what's happened so far this year. And so as a place to start, let's talk a little bit about the first 10 months of the year. How has your processes been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic so far? Um, what are some of the changes that you've made in your processes or new things that you introduced as a result of the world we're living in right now? All right, do you want the honors? 
Uh, <laughs> sure, I'll take the first one. I think um, <laughs> it's been an interesting and uh, challenging period, um, I think, for everyone. Our initial response to the pandemic, I'm sure, was very similar to a lot of you on this call today. Uh, we were quite early as a company to move our staff uh, to a working from home environment. And I think after an initial period of adjustment, it was really BAU. Um, we have a global team. So we were already used to working um, sort of in a virtual environment, holding calls via video or communicating electronically via email or, or chat or conference calls. So I think technology has enabled us to conduct our work uh, at City without material disruption. Uh, if I have to look at our investment managers, uh, we've moved to virtual meetings um, and conference calls. And so far, I think it, it's worked really, really well. One of the first things um, we did when uh, the COVID was still an epidemic, uh, mainly prevalent in Asia, was to reach out to our APEC based managers to ensure, you know, first of all, their staff were safe, to understand their situation and the impact on the region. And as soon as the, uh, I guess, WHO declared a pandemic, we extended that reach uh, further to our entire platform and moved to more actively monitor the COVID situation and, and the impact of, of that on our managers. Uh, IT and BCP has always been an integral part of uh, ODD at City, so it's an area we've always focused on even before the pandemic. Uh, I think it was good to see that the industry has shown, I guess, great resilience in terms of BCP with very few managers encountering material issues with, with business continuity in our experience. So that was our initial really approach to, to, to this uh, situation. Yeah, very, very similar for us. I mean, you know, our initial reaction and focus was on um, operational uh, resiliency. So, you know, our initial, initial concerns were all of our managers are having to move the entire workforce to a working from home environment. Um, a lot of our managers hadn't taken that into account as far as their BC arrangements were concerned. Um, so, you know, our initial conversations with managers were just understanding, you know, do you have the bandwidth for, for individuals to work from home, you know, your entire st your workforce? Um, and, you know, what's the impact on, on the functioning of key controls around the investment process? Um, so I remember, you know, during, during that initial time in early March, we spoke to all of our investment managers just, just to understand what the arrangements were and whether things were functioning correctly, whether they, be able to, they were able to put on risk or de-risk our portfolio as they normally would. Um, and we were generally pleasantly surprised by the reactions. Um, you know, we, we never had any significant issues with any of our managers. Um, and generally those operational infrastructures prove to be very ro robust. Um, you know, as we move into sort of a longer term sort of lockdown working from home of a more sustained period, I think the focus for us has moved more in terms of the cultural impact on staff, um, you know, and staff well-being on, on firm culture, that sort of thing. And, and also in private markets, the ability of, of the managers to source and implement new investments, um, you know, without being in that sort of office environments uh, where that's had any any um, impact on the deal pipeline. Great points from both of you. I think one of the things that we've seen this year that's been so striking is that uh, private markets managers, for the most part, unless their strategy is specifically impacted by the pandemic, um, have continued to have very robust fundraisers. And so as investors were brought along in that process and having to innovate as we go, because uh, unlike 2008, you know, the, there hasn't really been a lull in fundraising um, as a result of everything that uh, we all have been managing. Maybe taking it to the sort of the medium term impacts of the pandemic, which I think are something um, everyone on this uh, webinar is probably thinking about, which is what, what will last and what will revert to, to normal. Um, how are you thinking about ongoing and initial due diligence prospectively as we look forward to 2021 and the uncertain world that we live in right now? Um, I think I can say that we've been able to conduct our due diligence remotely as normal, both for ongoing reviews as well as new managers. We've had to adapt uh, the fact that we were unable to conduct on-site meetings, but I think platforms like Skype and, and Zoom have enabled us to still have a degree of video or call it face-to-face -face interaction with our investment managers. Uh, what we've seen is perhaps we have more touch points with investment managers during the onboarding process than we 
would have had prior. Uh, so instead of organizing one big on-site meeting um, where you spend the majority of the day with the manager in their office, we perhaps have multiple video and conference calls uh, and do more follow-ups electronically. Um, ultimately, the whole uh, drive behind our process is to be uh, comfortable with the controls and procedures that the manager has in place, and there are different ways to achieve this. I think what we have noticed that managers are perhaps a bit more comfortable sharing certain policies and procedures with us electronically when in the past um, they would only allow us to view those on, on site and within private markets, the use of things like data rooms um, have always been useful to access some of that fund documentation um, electronically. Um, a last, uh, last point is um, it's been fairly easy to organize meetings because people are generally more flexible with their time, um, they're more available, and we're all not traveling as much and most of us working remotely. So from that perspective, it's, it's been, been uh, beneficial. Completely agree. Um, you know, obviously life goes on. Um, you know, we, we haven't stopped, you know, appointing new managers or, or, or going forward with new investments. So, um, you know, initially, you know, back in February, March, we had discussions around what, how it would look in terms of not being able to be on site and verify key processes, um, which is generally our, our, our preferred uh, way of working. Um, but generally, I think working in this virtual world has been better than initially expected. Um, I think we still miss some, some miss out on some key controls. You know, some managers prefer not to share key policies and documents um, um, electronically with us. I mean, historically, you know, those sorts of documents we'd, re we'd review on site um, in, a, in a meeting environment. Um, and, um, and I'd also say, you know, maybe some of the softer communication interpersonal cues have maybe been lost uh, through communicating the way we are today. Uh, but generally, um, you know, there's also been some benefits. I mean, to Kwai's point, I, I agree totally on the versatility. Um, you know, it's to be certainly now flexible. Uh, you know, this more, just this morning, I had a, a, a DD meeting with one of our managers. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get through the whole agenda. So, you know, we just uh, simply pick up tomorrow or the next day from where we, we, le we left off. Whereas I think when, you, uh, when you're having on-site meetings in person, there can be some pressure to get through, the, get through your framework uh, in the allocated time. So I think that there has been some downside, but I think also some very positive aspects, which I don't think we expected beforehand. I would totally agree with those points. I, you know, I think this is where the investment and operational due diligence overlap in the sense that we have the same benefits and challenges to this situation. I, I talk to my team a lot about worrying about assessing the interpersonal body language between investment partners, uh, that we can't tell when you're the size of a postage stamp on people's screens, where if, if they're in the same room, um, sometimes you pick up on things. But I do think the benefits of almost a more organic conversation as opposed to someone coming in prepared to flip through their pitch book, which was always the tension that you were fighting when you're in the room with somebody at their offices or your offices. And now it's much more of a Q&A based agenda, I would find anecdotally from what we've experienced so far. But I do, I wonder a lot, and, and I think maybe we'll get some questions or thoughts from um, the audience in this webinar about um, sourcing new managers, because I do think that the productivity has remained high this year for all of our teams uh, with existing managers, existing relationships, existing diligences, but it's the same that we hear from some of our managers that you're more likely to stay with a known quantity this year, given you can't go to their offices, you can't fly to their city. Um, and so how do you generate those new ideas um, that are so important for next year's pipeline or the year after? So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, we may have already touched on this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit, both of you, about particular areas of operational risk during the pandemic that you've placed additional emphasis on so far? Jeff, yeah, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, so yes, I mean, you know, as, as quite touched on earlier, you know, we too have increased our, our monitoring of our managers. Um, we certainly have more sort of daily, weekly touch points than we did before. Um, I know our investment team are certainly interacting at least as much, if not more, than they did uh, before we went into into the crisis. Um, you know, the, the kind of things that we're focusing on are, you know, working from home arrangements, um, connectivity issues. Um, you know, the the ability for our managers to continue sourcing, underwriting, 
um, investments, carrying on with with um, with you know the on-site due diligence or whatever it might be. Obviously, that latter has been a, a bit of a, a bit of an impact. So I was just speaking to one of our real estate managers this morning, and you know the, the pipeline is strong. They do have you know did have some concerns around being able to to perform those on-site validations that they normally do. Um, but I think in terms of, of specific areas of focus, I mean, certainly operational resiliency, working from home arrangements, so the technology and infrastructure. Um, but then also from a cybersecurity um, perspective, we've, seen, we've definitely seen an uptick um, in cyber incidents. I mean, we, we've been involved in, in a couple over the last few months, um, both involving you know, industry-recognized service providers where um, you know, we've had some data breaches and so on and so forth. And quite often it's been a, a service provider of a service provider. So sort of one step, one step removed. But I would say main areas of focus, certainly cybersecurity, operational resiliency, and then just general culture and staff well-being, given that we're all now sort of operating within these four walls and not being able to have those interpersonal touch points that we had before. I think uh, I agree with you, Jeff. Similar to us, you know, technology, cybersecurity, and business continuity um, were up there, especially at the start. Um, I think as the pandemic evolved globally, uh, we did shift our focus on certain specific risk areas that were becoming more impacted by the pandemic at potentially a, a, an asset level. Um, things like closure of assets, you know, availability availability of cash levels, um, loans coming to maturity, you know, general impact of these issues on the viability of the GP. So um, I guess, how did we approach it? As part of our standard process, we already have uh, what we call an enhanced monitoring program, where we touch base with managers, where we've identified certain high risks um, on at least a quarterly basis. But I think what we noted, uh, during the pandemic is that quarterly potentially wasn't frequent enough. Uh, there was too much changing uh, too quickly. And so we implemented an active platform monitoring review process. Uh, we conducted a risk-based assessment of our entire platform for focusing on certain strategies we determined could be impacted by COVID, like retail or hospitality. And then we cast classified East Manager um, with a COVID risk score. Uh, that focus, and we focus our efforts on those managers with higher risk scores um, in areas of liquidity, debt financing, et cetera. Um, we then resorted to having weekly calls with some of uh, these high risk managers, uh, the ones that are most affected by the pandemic. And that really allowed us to stay on top of these uh, you know, very uh, frequent and quick changes and uh, allow us to escalate any of these material issues uh, to senior management. And then from an ODD perspective, uh, I think it was really important for us to have a good relationship with the investment due diligence team uh, to work closely together and ensure we have open communication between us and also the, the investment managers on our platform. Great, all very interesting topics. Maybe just as a follow-up, if, if either of you have any thoughts, have you seen anything innovative in particular that real estate managers have done given the opportunity set that there may be out there to invest in, but the need to physically be where the assets are? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've certainly seen sort of um, a lot of our managers making use of local service providers. I mean, I think this is something they always did. Um, whereas I think before they did this in hand, hand in hand with, with you know, traveling into to see local property companies and that sort of thing. Uh, whereas now I think they're relying a lot more on their local local agents, local advisors, and local network to, to, to go through a lot of those, those verifications. I think uh, one of the benefits that some of the managers have where they are developing real estate assets is that in a lot of countries, uh, construction um, after the initial um, sort of initial spike in pandemic, construction uh, was resumed. So, um, you know, under strict uh, COVID guidelines, but that was a benefit that they would still able to access those sites and that work was continuing um, within like a, a different environment. But um, uh, yeah, similar to JF, uh, we've seen managers trying to uh, visit sites where possible, um, subject to restrictions in local areas. Okay, great. Um, just a reminder to our audience that you can use the Zoom function for Q&A to ask questions, and we'll queue those up 
um, after we get through some of our prearranged questions and, and circle back on areas that people want to hear more on. Um, just for the next question, I think we're, we're right on the calendar point where third quarter valuations start to come out. And Kwai, you mentioned some of the liquidity and solvency issues that you were tracking in portfolios. Can you both talk a little bit more about valuation approaches this year? Um, you know, the environment's been moving so quickly that the, the mark to market has to be challenging, but what have you observed um, that's different and, and how are you and your managers approaching valuations? Uh, sure, I think generally speaking, in my view, the best way to approach the fair value of an asset is a combination of an input from the investment manager who's closest to the asset and independent input, for example, from a third party valuation agent. Uh, it is one of the requires, requirements that we have for um, our platform uh, in private markets for managers to use third party valuation a uh, agents to value their assets periodically. Now, what we've seen throughout the pandemic is a lack of reliable market data with a lack of transactions in the market, it's been harder for third party appraisers to, to value private market assets accurately or to determine you know, the right level of discounts. Um, you know, what you also need to take into account is that an updated valuation of an asset in the current market climate might impact the fund's debt financing or loan covenants uh, like LTVs. On the other hand, lenders might request a valuation from you as part of a refinancing discussion. So there's lots to think about. But ultimately, I think investors um, understand that private market investments are long term. And as long as there's still a conviction in the investment, we need to find a pragmatic way to assess operational efficiency of an asset versus the long term business plans and valuations. Um, what I think is very important is to make sure managers um, are making the right disclosures to clients so that investors are aware of the basis of the valuations that they're seeing in their quarterly reports and their LP statements. Um, so especially if the manager is deviating from uh, the internal valuation policy um, for reasons driven by COVID. So I think that disclosure and that transparency is really, really um, important. Um, and we've been focusing on that to make sure managers are, are um, adhering to that. And um, I think that's, that's it's a challenging subject, but I think um, we've had to find a pragmatic approach and speak to managers on a on a case by case basis to understand what they're doing, um, what the valuations look like, and um, you know what the basis is for some of the decisions they've made. Absolutely, I mean, I, I think I think the March and June quarter ends were quite testing in terms of valuation governance uh, at the GPs. Um, I think a lot of the GPs, you know, looked depending on the strategy. For example, if it was private equity, they're looking at sort of things like peer group multiples. Um, if it was real estate, they maybe look at the independent valuers' valuation or delays. Um, and I think a lot of GPs maybe had to take decisions to, to if, if not impair, then, um, then override some of those asset valuations. And I think that was a big test um, for a lot of GPs and their valuation committees. And so it was, a, you know, it was an area of focus for us. I mean, when we were speaking to our, our GPs, you know, just understanding, you know, what you know, what valuations they're taking, what base cases and that sort of thing. Um, we did see some slight delays, especially in March. Um, speaking to the managers, a lot of our managers towards the end of March, a lot of them warned us that, you know, NAV delivery, reporting delivery, normal quarterly capital account statement delivery might be slightly delayed. Um, we weren't too badly impacted by that, although we, we did notice some of them were, were, you know, received a bit later than usual. Um, one thing we did notice is that a few of our funds that have 31st of March year ends, um, a big discussion with the auditors was around emphasis on matter. So we saw two or three sets of financial statements um, from funds where the auditors placed emphasis on matter within their, within their opinion. Um, you know, not, 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 not necessarily uh, changing the actual audit opinion, but just drawing attention to the fact that um, the valuation, um, you know, there, might, there may be variations in the valuation uh, because of the COVID crisis. So I, th I think things have now calmed down substantially since, since those March and June year ends. But I think at, at that time, there definitely was a lot of discussion around, around valuation. Certainly, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what I would add with my investment 
diligence hat on was in addition to all the work we were doing in partnership with our operational due diligence team on point in time valuations. Um, we spent an enormous amount of time with all of our managers, uh, similar to comments that have already been made on prospective views of the portfolio, making sure their managers had very tight bucketing of, we called it red, yellow, green, of companies or assets within the portfolio and why things could be red, yellow, green, capturing a lot of inputs, whether it was liquidity um, or per prospective performance of cyclical assets or retail assets um, as a way of augmenting those valuations, um, you know, where the, the process might be tighter and not necessarily capture all of those inputs to really understand what assets were stressed or de-stressed. Um, and I think that's a conversation that we continue to have and refine really quarterly with portfolios right now. And I think managers have to expect that LPs will want that type of insight into the portfolios. And um, when I think back to 2008, you know, there was a lot of who can know, you know, capital markets, who could possibly know. I don't feel like um, we're hearing that as much from managers. People really are focused on the fundamentals and trying to put in place some framework about how assets might perform in the next year based on basic assumptions. Um, maybe circling back to something I think, JF, you mentioned a little bit already um, about third-party service providers and some breaches that we've seen this year, but that's a topic that I think will be of interest um, to everyone here is, um, you know, what's been some of the impact this year and whether it's COVID or not, just it happened to happen in 2020 as well with third-party service providers and how do you think about that sort of value chain that we're all exposed to of uh, vendors having vendors and, and how that works? I think, I mean, I think this environment, just as it's impacted managers and GPs, I think it's also challenged the operating models of a lot of third-party service providers. So thinking specifically about sort of third-party administrators, I think the working from home model has really kind of taxed their, their business continuity ar arrangements. Um, I remember being on an ODD meeting with one of our managers back in the summer, and they mentioned that their, uh, their administrator, who are you know, a large big five global administrator uh, with an office on the um, Asian subcontinent, um, sort of the, uh, the local government sort of marched into their offices uh, at some stage during March and kind of told them all to evacuate the, the building with immediate effect. So um, it was a very, very interesting, uh, interesting to hear that. Um, but you know, I think generally the, the service providers um, have reacted in the same way that GPs have. I think had we had this issue five or 10 years ago, I think we could be looking at a very different risk environment from a service provider uh, perspective because you know, we were able to have these virtual calls. Um, there's all the, um, the platforms that Kwai mentioned earlier that we'd be able to use like Zoom, Skype, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas I think you, if, you go, if you wind back the clock 10 years, I just don't think that would have been the case. I think a lot of, a lot of administrators, third parties and you know, firms would have really struggled um, with getting staff up and running, working from home and be able to do all those things that they normally do in the office. I, I totally agree with, with that, JF. And I think when we are conducting uh, the onboarding of a new manager, uh, part of that is to assess the administrator they're appointing for the fund, um, making sure they uh, are a reputable firm, um, understanding their internal controls and procedures, their, their internal re controls reports, et cetera, but also to understand their capability in terms of IT and BCP. Um, because I think it's these types of situations where um, you're relying on an administrator that holds your data, both for the fund and for investors, um, to continue to operate under these circumstances without material impact on um, the transfer of data between the manager and the administrator and, um, you know, the day-to-day -day, um, accounting, etc. So I think we initially um, reached out to a cross-section of our third-party administrators uh, servicing the managers on our platform just to understand uh, the impact of, of COVID on the, on the BCP plans when this started. Um, and then, as JF mentioned, you know, there were some issues with... Um, a certain third party provider where there were certain breaches on the be on the back of that we decided again to do another exercise to understand whether the administrators are aware and control the use of third parties um, so another step removed from the manager uh, as well as the managers understanding whether their third parties are using other third parties, whether it's for support of, of their systems or, or whether development is outsourced. So I think um, it's 
equally important to look at those service providers and their BCP plans to understand that they are resilient um, to unfortunate situations like this. And as a follow up to that, how far down the chain do you look? Is at some point are you validating the operational diligence process of your administrator, or are you actually re underwriting the vendors that they have as well? Because you know there can be three or four different entities that might be providing service behind the direct vendor that you work with. Yeah, that's a good question. So our, we start with the manager and the manager's understanding of the third parties they um, engage with and their uh, review of those. And then we have separate uh, due diligence on the underlying party themselves. I think um, we need to understand that there's a process for them internally to assess who they're using, assess the uh, capability of those third parties. I think it's in inevitable for companies to use third parties or outsourcing, but it's more, do you know who you're outsourcing to? Do you know their cybersecurity and BCP plans? Um, are you comfortable with those? Are you reviewing them on an ongoing basis to make sure they are up to scratch and there are no material breaches, et cetera? So um, we don't underwrite the third party of the third party, um, but we uh, we do want to understand whether the manager and the administrator have processes in place to assess those third parties um, at the onset and uh, on an ongoing basis as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely the same for us. Um, you know, you, you've got to place some reliance on the manager and the administrator in terms of how they appoint their third parties and oversee and monitor their third, third parties. And, that, and that's something we definitely assess as part of our framework. Okay. Maybe if you could each talk a little bit about any ways in which the dynamics between the investment diligence team and the operational due diligence team have changed this year for you. I mean, for us, it's definitely, I mean, I, I feel uh, we've never collaborated or interacted more closely with our investment team. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's definitely been positive. I mean, you know, um, within our setup, um, our ODD function sits within our risk uh, directorate. Um, which is sort of segregated from our from our investment team. So um, I think definitely there's been more interactions with, you know, between ourselves and the rest of the team and the investment team um, over the last few months. Uh, and that's because you know we, we're very risk focused, we're very risk minded, and um, you know both both teams want to make sure that we do the right thing by our by our members. And so um, you know collaboration has definitely been a key a key aspect of of how we've worked over the last nine months. Same for us. Uh, I think generally we have strong relationships with the IDD teams globally. Um, we collaborate very closely when we onboard a manager, we present jointly to the various committees within the private bank. Um, but when the uh, pandemic started, we conducted separate risk assessments. So ODD and IDD did their own assessment of the platform and what they thought was important and they risked the managers according to their own sort of rating but we were very conscious in our approach to contacting the managers on the back of that assessment to ensure we were joined up you know to avoid that managers were receiving duplicate questions from ODD and IDD or were having to attend multiple calls with different people within city under what, what already you know quite stressful circumstances so um, we ensured that things were escalated in a timely manner between ODD and IDD make sure everyone was aware of changes occurring at the manager uh, and when they occurred. And I think ultimately the pandemic demonstrated that close collaboration between ODD and IDD is really essential to, to navigate a challenging environment like this. Totally agree with both of those comments. And, um, you know, I think in, in our, my business, the operational investment diligence process when we're underwriting managers runs independently to make uh, separate decisions um, for that sort of independence. But, you know, it's we're in a non-linear time now. Uh, and so all of the linear processes that we've put in place don't, don't really work. And so it's an interesting collaboration. And it's at least in my private markets business, we've had the benefit of a few really strong years where we haven't had to do that type of non-linear collaboration the way we did earlier in the decade, um, you know, where every month or every year had new news and new challenges to assess in the existing portfolios. So uh, it's a small silver lining, but it is a, it's a good experience for the team, at least uh, in my business, where we have and had that as much in the last few years. 
Um, maybe looking forward, and, and this is a very sort of blue sky question, hoping that, you know, maybe the industry will change in certain interesting and innovative ways as a result of everything that we're experiencing today. But love to hear from you things that you do expect to change in the future based on what we've experienced and things that could, might, would be wonderful if they did change. Um, you know, I know we all came out of 2008 thinking that that might bring GPs and LPs closer together. And maybe it did in some ways, but probably not as much as any of us expected. And maybe it'll be different this time. Would you say um, quite more, more drone surveillance maybe? <laughs> 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 that, that could be useful. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking about this and I remember when I started uh, working at a fund of funds, um, our Asian managers used to, uh, uh, investors, sorry, used to come and visit us in London and they used to take a photograph of themselves in front of our office door and our logo as a way to sort of document that they were actually there and that the office actually existed. Now, fast forward to today, I think the world looks very, very different. And as, as it was mentioned earlier, I think technology platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams really have been instrumental in allowing us to execute our ODD assessments during the pandemic. Um, we've been able to conduct the meetings virtually. Uh, I think they will continue to play a role in DD assessments going forward. Uh, apart from allowing video conference calls, they can also be used to share screens so if you um, want to look at the policy that the manager doesn't want to send you, you know, there's that capability um, on these platforms to do that. They can be used for system demos, for example, trading or order management systems where the manager can show that virtually. Um, I think managers have been more accommodating, as I said earlier, to share some of these things. So that's been a benefit. I do think it doesn't entirely take away um, the importance of face-to-face -face meetings, in, in particular for new managers, where you need to really build those strategic relationships. In private markets, it's all long-term um, strategic relationships. And I think um, you can achieve that much quicker if you meet people face-to-face. -face. Uh, I do think it's interesting to see how the industry is gonna evolve, you know, and what other solutions brilliant minds will bring uh, or develop to potentially make this, this virtual world um, a bit more efficient. But I think it's gonna be a bit of a mixture between um, on sites in a more efficient way uh, and the sort of virtual interaction. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any substitute for, you know, a good on-site due diligence meeting. However, having said that, I don't think we've lost as much as I think we would have thought initially. Um, I think we need to be a bit more clever and a bit more rigorous with our, you know, the way we verify certain things. So, you know, things like background checking, reference checking, um, I think, you know, that, that certainly goes a long way to helping. Um, you know, as you mentioned, we've also, you know, especially on the more liquid market side, uh, where we're looking at sort of trade workflow, you know, we received virtual demos from a lot of our managers where normally we'd go on site, sit next to a trader and watch them putting on the trades. Um, and the same in the private market space where, you know, you're looking at certain um, sort of more financed operational activities like, capital call and distribution processes and controls and cash controls and that sort of thing. And we've also been able to, va to validate through virtual um, demos, which a lot of our managers have been very um, innovative in terms of, of putting on for us, which has been great. Um, but, you know, something else we discussed back in, in March um, was the making use of local service providers. So if we're appointing a manager in, you know, in, in Singapore or in Boston, for example, you know, making sure that we, we can engage with a local provider to perform those, those verification checks. But to be honest, it hasn't really come to that. Um, we've been able to, to get the comfort that we, we need and, um, you know, complete the various areas of our framework without having to resort to those sorts of measures. Okay. Um, I, hope, I hope some of those things come into fruition. I'd, I'd add just two things. And the first is not because of who our wonderful hosts are today, but I do wonder if, um, you know, this causes a little bit of a forcing function to more standardized technology in the private markets, which 
you know, managers in many cases have resisted up till now and ha not had to undertake because of the capital flowing into the asset class and perhaps the sort of realities of the world that we live in finally overcome that institutional resistance, which I think would be a great savings and benefit both for GPs and LPs. And then I do wonder a lot as well about whether some of those validations that, you know, we're still depending on humans, if some of that could be um, benefited by use of the blockchain in innovative ways. And I think we're starting to see some of our managers at least ask those questions and, and start to think about that. So I hope when we're Talking about this five years from now, some of those benefits have, have resulted from this, this period in time. Maybe we could uh, take the same question and talk a little bit about changes the managers themselves are making. And um, JF, you talked a little bit about um, some of the regulatory focus um, when we had prepared for this. Um, so we'd love to have you touch a little bit on that and any other changes that we think managers are undertaking in their business this year as a result of what they're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, we saw the FCA here in the UK in the start of the year um, sort of issue some sort of dear CEO letters to some of the private market managers um, looking to understand a bit more about their kind of internal governance structures, how they appoint directors to portfolio companies um, and how, um, you know, associate policies have been followed for different portfolio companies. So definitely an interest in terms of how GPs are overseeing and managing portfolio companies. Um, just very recently, I understand from a, a, one of our compliance consultants that um, a few of the, the larger uh, PE firms in the industry um, received sort of follow-up notifications from the FCA asking for more details. Um, so, you know, looking ahead into 2021, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the major regulators like the SEC, FCA, um, start paying a bit more attention to some of these aspects in terms of governance process and controls, um, given, you know, what's happened happened so far this year. Um, one thing I think would be very positive is if, um, and I think it's something we need as, as ODD and ID, as an ID community um, is transparency. Um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of managers who nece weren't necessarily willing to share key documents and policies and processes um, electronically, um, I, I think those managers need to sort of, you know, move, move along with the times and, and maybe open up a bit more become a bit more transparent. I mean, I'm hoping moving into the new year that that is one of the changes we'll see is sort of managers becoming a bit more transparent, letting go of those sort of, those policies that they've, that they've held on to. I agree with that, Jeff. I think one of the things I think might, uh, we also might see a shift in is there will be more um, regulatory focus on compliance with internal policies and the use of, um, company approved communication methods. I think we've seen um, some of those things in the news where, um, you know, things like using WhatsApp, you know, by front office is gonna be harder to monitor if people are working from home. So I think if a manager chooses to um, not have people in the office, uh, these are some of the things that they would have to find solutions for. I also do think it, there is still value in um, people interacting in the office where compliance and risk sit in the office where the investment team sits um, to create a culture of compliance that I think is it's much harder to achieve in a virtual world. This makes sense. I think the other thing I would add, and this is anecdotal, I'd love to do a survey on this at some point is um, in terms of managers making changes is I think I've seen an acceleration in managers adding COOs to their organizations. And we're seeing that more down into the middle market than just the larger market um, managers. And it makes perfect sense when you look at this year and say, uh, the running of the business has become much more complicated. It's not just the running of the investments anymore. And, and there's a need for professionalization and more help in that regard. Um, maybe I'll just ask one last question to the panelists before we go to um, a great list of questions we have from our audience. Um, just if you could, for a minute, um, to speak on new investment ideas that your teams have worked on this year and whether you've had the flexibility to change um, in light of what's been going on in the market and pursue different strategies or if it was really business as usual. 
I'll start because uh, you'll, you'll yeah, probably have the more interesting response, Kai. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not and, sure. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I mean, being a pe- being a pension fund, you know, obviously a lot of our asset allocations are kind of predefined. So, um, you know, for us, really business as usual. I mean, you know, we we have our kind of strategic asset allocation which we follow, uh, and that's been followed, you know, throughout the throughout this period as per usual. So, Kai, you may have a more interesting response for us. Well, I think uh, it is more of a question for our, our investment due diligence team, but I think generally speaking, certain strategies have obviously done better than others. You know, the pandemic has it had an impact um, on positive impact potentially on logistics and warehousing where hospitality has been, um, you know, affected more negatively. But I think investment teams globally uh, will have had to make adjustments to the deal pipeline as the year went by just to accommodate some of those shifts, um, you know, Crises is create opportunities, um, and and I think people will have uh, jumped on some of those where possible. From an ODD perspective, ultimately we've been able to conduct our reviews to support the investment team's sort of dynamic deal pipeline, and. It did mean that uh, the timelines that we agreed potentially at the beginning of the year, some of them will have been accelerated uh, and changed. But I think ODD professionals in general are quite used to and resilient to those sort of type of last minute changes. So um, hopefully we've been able to support the, the investment team as they sort of navigating that quite difficult period of, of, of you know, identifying the right opportunities. Great. Well, well, thank you for answering all those questions. We'll just take a few minutes here and try to get through a few of the great questions that we've gotten from our audience. I think um, disclosure is clearly one area that a lot of people um, had questions on. And so maybe I'll put together two questions, which is, um, do you have a minimum level of disclosure that you require from your managers, um, you know, for example, venture managers who give you their LPA and DDQ and say that's that, um, how do you manage that? And secondarily to that, have you had any legal workarounds you've put in place in order to um, protect yourself from things you can't verify given the current environment? Uh, I think we, we definitely have a tried and tested ODD framework at, at City. So um, I can say we haven't been able, we uh, haven't been, um, had a need to deviate from that. I think we hold our managers to quite a high standard. And if you don't meet that standard, you just don't get onboarded. Um, we have looked at new managers this year and onboarded new managers this year, both established and, and emerging. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are different ways to become comfortable with these processes and procedures. And um, we work very closely with these investment managers to um, mitigate some of the risks as we identify. So it's not just a, a tick the box exercise where you say, oh, they don't have this, you know, we can't onboard them. We have a very clear dialogue with them and with the investment team to see what we can achieve. And sometimes these, these onboarding deals take quite a long time. You know, it could take a few months for us to get comfortable. So I think um, instead of axing the ID, it's more, can we work with the manager to get comfortable? What do we need to get there? And how can we put some of these um, agreed changes into the documentation? Um, I can't say we've had to have uh, legal workarounds uh, on the deals that I've worked on. Um, generally, we've been able to achieve the transparency that we required from, from the managers. I think they know um, what our uh, requirements are from the start. And if they want to work with us, um, you know, they're typically flexible to make those changes. Very, yeah, very similar response from my perspective. I mean, we also have a formal OD framework, um, which includes a, a questionnaire, which we um, have customized for all our various asset classes. So we have, and also depending on how we want to structure the investment. So um, for example, we have questionnaires for private equity, real estate, you know, um, old credit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we generally expect a high level of disclosure and transparency from the, from the managers. Um, if a manager turned around and you sort of told us they weren't willing to provide us with a response, um, we would certainly view that in a dim light. Um, it would definitely be an area of concern, uh, which we'd raised you know, through our governance and investment committees. Um, if we thought that we were not getting the transparency that we need or deserve, um, I don't think we would go ahead um, you know, we, we definitely see our, man, our relationships with our managers as strategic partnerships and business partnerships. Um, you know, we've got a record for doing a lot, large number of re-ups, 
Um, and you know, generally, you know, we, we have long-standing relationships with our managers. So uh, fortunately, not an issue which I've experienced so far, certainly not within this portfolio. Um, but certain, you know, I think if we did have any manager not willing to disclose certain things, I think it, it would definitely would not be received very well. Um, same as quite in terms of legal, um, legal, um, you know, le uh, legal disclosures and that sort of thing. I can't think of anything specific that we've added just for COVID, although obviously in reviewing prospectuses and LPAs, there have been, you know, additional disclosures added. Um, that's, you know, certainly been the case since, since sort of February or March time. Right. I think the only thing I would add to that, um, and we have navigated this with a number of venture managers, is I think this is another area where partnership between operational and investment diligence is so important. And I've found that pulling a lot of those discussions on disclosure and transparency to the beginning and having a very direct conversation with a manager as the investment lead saying, this is what we expect. We're sharing our requirements with you, even some of our language for our side letters, which is particularly specific. And now you are able to go away and think about whether this is a this is a relationship that you'd like to have or not, um, and that's been very respectful to their processes and to to what we need, um, as opposed to you know sort of seventh inning everyone's done a lot of work and you come to the sticking point. So uh, that little bit more on that. Um, maybe another question, and I'm happy to chime in on this one as well. But sourcing new managers. Um, you know, how has that changed? Are there any new things that your teams are doing in order to identify unknown managers in this market? Might be one for you, Suzanne. Um, if, <laughs> I think we we uh, we generally you know we take the lead from our, our investment team who are responsible for sort of the origination and sourcing of the managers. So we were kind of one step removed, I guess, sure. uh, from that process. So I think from from our perspective, um, two things. One is I think conferences have actually gone better than would have been expected. I'm not the world's biggest fan of Zoom, but I've found some very good networking to be had at conferences. And we're actually trying to spend more time going to niche conferences and doing the networking breakouts there. Now that you don't have to get on a plane and fly to Arizona or California to, to attend that conference. So that's been very useful. And then the other thing is, um, you know, other people mentioned earlier that people are more accessible. And so we've spent a lot more time um, speaking to other limited partners when we're referencing managers and spending time with them saying, who else are you excited about? Who should we meet? And using that word of mouth as a way to stay ahead of things. Um, and so I would say we're actually probably placing an additional emphasis on networking with our whole team because we have the time to do it all those hours that we're not all on planes now. So that's been a bit of a silver lining. Um, other questions? We probably have time for a couple more. Um, I think one would be a very specific question that was asked, have you seen an increase in expenses passed on to the limited partners because of any um, changes in process due to coronavirus? I, uh, I certainly, so you go ahead, Kwai. No, 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 go ahead. Dana. I, I was going to say, no, I, I actually haven't. So it's, it's probably the opposite, actually, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not unusual within uh, private market strategies for travel costs and other disbursements to be passed on to the, to the limited partnership. Um, because of you know, the lack of ability to travel and that sort of thing, it's probably gone the other way. I think there's actually going to be fewer costs being passed through uh, the PL than, than in, in other years, actually. I was going to say the same thing, uh, Jeff, and I think we'll see the evidence of this in the in you know in next year's uh, when, when this year's financials are available next year but uh yeah i don't uh expect and don't i haven't seen any evidence of um additional costs being being allocated um uh to the partnerships at this at this point okay and another question sort of in a similar theme um any perspectives on trade error prevalence have you seen more of those in the work from home environment or any changes in, in how managers would um, would reimburse clients with trade errors? Mm. It's, a good, it's a good question. I can, I can start if you like, Kwai. Um, yeah, so, so this is certainly an area that we pay a lot of attention to with an IOD framework is, is uh, you know, trade error policy. Um, during those early sort of March, April days, when we were speaking to managers and sort of increasing our, our oversight, we, we, we did have a lot of conversations about um, any workarounds to trade workflow. So, you know, if, 
if you had pre-trade compliance controls in place, for example, if compliance had to um, override certain soft or hard stops within the pre-trade compliance process, um, you know, have those controls been circumvented? And generally the response was no. I, all, all those controls that are there to mitigate trade errors certainly still in place. Um, and then also, you know, as per usual, ensuring that the trade error policies that the managers have are favorable to investors. So, you know, when we see an, a, a, a manager that says, you know, if they are responsible for an operational error or trade error, that they're gonna pass on the cost to, to us as the investor, we certainly take a very dim view of that. Um, and generally, you know, we wanna see investor managers um, take responsibility for those operational errors. I would agree with that, JF. Um, I think the focus on the policy, the policy should be applied regardless of, you know, what sort of operational situation the manager is in. But I think one of the things that we also focus on is, you know, automation and straight through processing, which reduces the risk of human error. So it doesn't really matter whether the, you know, the, the person is in the office or at home, because those processes are going to go through the same order management system um, from the moment of input to sort of the downflow to the, the operations and accounting team. So I think those things which are already generally part of our um, operational focus uh, are put in place to mitigate issues occurring in these types of situations as well. So I think that, that um, also helps to, to reduce those risks. I mean, have we seen an, an uptick in trade errors? I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, we definitely come across a few, but I wouldn't say um, out, of the, out of the usual trade errors. Great. Another very specific question that was an interesting one. Um, someone asked, are managers allowing you to record your Zoom meetings with them? Never asked, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> they may we, be recording them. I, I don't yeah. think I've asked for them to be recorded. Uh, neither have we, to be honest. Um, Has anyone ever asked you if they can record it? Uh, no, not yeah, in my experience. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll just finish up with one last sort of future facing question, which is, um, are there types of ESG related topics that your teams are starting to ask about as part of either your upfront or ongoing reviews? Um, and the examples this, the, uh, pers the attendee asked were preparation for EU taxonomy or UK DWP asset ownership reporting. Are those things that you consider today? Very interesting. Uh, I'm actually part of an ESG working group focusing entirely on that. <laughs> and we know that um, with the FS SFDR regulation um, and reporting requirements coming into play in March next year, I think there's a big push uh, for firms to put a sustainability risk policy in place where they don't have one and to make sure um, they also disclose how sustainability risk is taken into account in their investment decision-making process. So whether an E, an S or an G um, can ultimately have a negative impact on an investment, uh, investments valuation. So uh, it is work in progress. You know, firms like City, we, we do have um, sustainability uh, policies at firm level, you know, group level, but I think we're taking it down to the level of also looking at what our third party managers have in place. Um, not only whether they fall within the S SFDR EU regulation, because a lot of them might be US based and fall outside, but in general, whether they do have a sustain sustainability policy, because I think so far, um, there's been a lot of talk about ESG and ESG focus, um, but regulators are now wanting to avoid greenwashing um, and slowly, I think the regulators around the world are going to um, sort of unify and focus on this even more. So um, we generally focus on things like governance in our, in our DDQ already, um, but we are looking at incorporating some of those more specific ESG and sustainability risk um, elements into our DDQ um, to form an understanding of what managers are doing, but also to make sure they are complying with regulation where they fall within um, certain requirements of, 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 uh, of the law, in particularly now in Europe, but it will expand eventually into other jurisdictions as well. I think it's just an, an, an inevitable development. Yeah, I mean, obviously being a, a public sector corporation like we are, you know, we, we definitely aim to, sort of, to be seen as taking a lead in this area. Um, Fortunately for me, we have a, a very, very competent and capable ESG team <laughs> within the PPF. So um, ESG doesn't necessarily fall under the, the ODD framework. 
However, we have a very close collaborative relationship with our ESG team. Um, and quite often, you know, we will, we will go out and look at certain controls and processes supporting ESG processes and governance with the managers um, on behalf of that team. But, um, you know, we've come out this year with sort of uh, ESG reporting, sustainability reporting, um, which is available on our, on our websites. Um, but, um, you know, further to that, uh, fortunately, not, you know, not necessarily my, my area. Great. Well, with that, I think um, that's all the time we have for questions today. I would uh, just start by thanking Kwai and JF for joining us today. Thank you for our attendees for making the time in a very busy week, month, and year to join us and for great questions. I wish we could have gotten through even more of them. Um, and thank you to Diligence Vault for having me and the entire panel for this great discussion today. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Guillaume. Yes, and thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Quay and Jean-Francois for sharing your experience and your views. Um, as we close this webinar, you will see on your screen a, a new poll for everyone to, uh, to complete. And, um, you know, we want, to thank you, we want to thank you all the participants for choosing to spend this time with us today. Uh, as ever, we appreciate your feedback. So we'd love to hear from you. For our next webinar, we are going to move on to the retail wholesale long only fund market. And our speaker will be talking about the role of the active fund selectors and the impact of technology when selecting funds. This one will take place in two weeks on November 18th at 2 p.m. GMT. You can find more information on our website and our newsletter. As for now, um, we are going to wrap up the takeaway notes and they will be available in the next few days. The recording will also be available on YouTube and on our website. So thank you again for joining the discussion and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.